I'm going to ask somebody to swing that door shut or we're going to be joining the kids in their class here in just a moment. Uh, sleep. Sleep is, uh, is one of the most amazing experiences, I think, that we get to have as human beings. It creates one of the most continual changes and rejuvenation. Uh, in an average lifetime, we're transformed from you know, cranky, confused, weary, zombie-like people into refreshed, energized, happy beings. And if you live to be about 80, that's going to happen over 30,000 times in your life. Talk about the grace of God every day being evident. huh? Uh, when applied patiently and systematically, however... Sleep deprivation is said to be one of the most effective forms of coercion and torture, which may explain a lot about parents of newborns. During the first two years of a newborn's life, parents will lose six months of sleep, a quarter of, of their time. Now, most humans spend about a third of our lifetime sleeping, about 25 years or more, depending on how much you nap, uh, we can survive longer without food than without sleep. Each year, sleep-related errors and accidents cost just our country over $56 billion. They cause nearly 25,000 deaths and result in 2.5 million people having disabling injuries just because they're sleep-deprived or tired. Uh, sleep in the animal kingdom is not uniform. Giraffes are, uh, only sleep about 1.9 hours a day, and they do it in 10-minute increments. Okay, So they scatter it throughout the day. Koalas, on the other hand, are the longest sleeping animals. They sleep 22 hours a day. I, I think sloths got a bad rap for some reason, but koalas are really the, they, they take the cake here. And when you're sleeping in a new place for the first time, scientists have discovered that one hemisphere of your brain remains more active than the other during sleep because they think it's sort of a vigilance mode that your body kicks into automatically to, because you don't know what the threats are that are necessarily around you in a new place. Children do not react to uh, sleep deprivation the same way adults do. We get sleepy and cranky. They get hyperactive, okay? Which uh, may explain why uh, a lack of sleep can result in ADHD-like symptoms for kids. Um, children, on the average, by the way, need about 10 hours of sleep. And uh, adults, most adults, if you drop below six hours of sleep a night, it will have medical effects on you. It will have negative medical effects on your life. So, if you happen to fall asleep in church today, I'll take that as a compliment, okay? The psalmist even says, he says, God grants sleep to those he loves, Psalm 127, verse 2. So I'll just think God's pouring out his love on you if you, if you just kind of nod off during any service. That's how it works around here, okay? No wonder Paul picks up this theme of sleep when he's talking about one of the most important things that he's calling us to in Christ. And that's what we're looking at today in Romans chapter 13. So if you've got your Bibles, turn there. Uh, we're going to be reading just the last paragraph of that chapter, verses 11 through 14. So here's what Paul says. He says, and do this, we'll come back to that, what this is. Do this, understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber. Because your salvation is nearer now than when you first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the day and the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousies. Rather, clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. Now, we're jumping in, obviously, to the end of a lot of discourse that Paul has made here. 
And uh, so we have to ask the question when you read this text, Paul says, and do this, do what? Well, the entire beginning in chapter 12 of Romans is all about uh, what does love really look like when you carry out the life of Christ in you and you love your neighbor as yourself, what's that going to look like? And so that's what Paul is referring to. The what is loving other people, loving people around you as God has loved you and as he calls and as you love yourself. So don't mistakenly think that just because this is the call that God's put on you, that you have the power to do it. Okay? No more, any more than you or I have the power to consistently keep any of the commandments. You know, people will say, well, yeah, love your neighbor as yourself, and, and, and that's what we're called to do. Yes, but that's impossible. That's impossible apart from Christ. And so God's not saying, hey, just drum up more willpower here. Uh, what he's going to show us is how we are to experience that impossible law in knowing and experiencing Christ. But here Paul's telling us that there, there's, a, there's another powerful motivation we saw some motivation last week. Uh, in this one, he says, you will be powerfully motivated to live the life of Christ, to in, put on Christ when you understand something, when you understand the present time, says the paragraph. Now, there are different ways in which the Scripture uses the present time. Uh, you think back in, in the life of Israel, the, the men of Issachar in uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 12. It, it said of them that they... They understood the times, okay? And so they governed their people according to the days in which they were living. They understood what was going on in the world, what was going on in their culture, and they were men of understanding. They understood the times. That's not the context of this particular time that Paul is referring to. However, I would say we are in a, such a time in the life of the world, not just our culture, not just our nation, but the life of the world when we are desperately in need of men and women walking with Christ who understand the times. These are unparalleled times. These are unique times. These are not our parents' times. These are times such of which the world has never experienced to date. We have never seen a time in the history of the world where all nations are working together on the same agenda. Never. And let me just give you an example. I had a conversation this week with, uh, with someone who's, who's living in another country, and uh, their home country has made it illegal for you to educate your children at home. So homeschooling is illegal in their country, and they will take your children from you if you try to do that. If you don't put them in the public school, they will take your children away from you. The second thing is that nowadays, not only do you have to send your children to the public school there, but if you do not do as the government says in vaccinating your children, they will take your children away. So thousands of parents are packing their bags and leaving their homes, their wealth, their jobs, and moving to different countries. And this is not, if I was to say the name of the country, you would be surprised. This is, this is a Western nation. I also had a conversation this week with someone who's living in a different country, and they, because it's a smaller country, they have contact with some of the government officials um, you're closer to national officials when it's a smaller country. It's easier to get to them. Well, one of their friends is a cabinet minister, and uh, this gentleman was sharing uh, that, in fact, they were in a meeting with the president of this country uh, at which the International Monetary Fund was there, their leaders were there, and the United Nations leaders were there. And they said to the president, we've got half a billion dollars we're ready to give you right away. Uh, to help your country. We're, we're just asking one thing. And he said, what's that one thing? And they said, well, uh, we want you to adopt in your educational system the LGBTQ agenda. And the president, who is a believer, said, why would you want us to do that? And they said, because 
we are finding around the world that the biggest obstacle to getting people to conform to what we want them to conform to is the family. So we are asking you to help us dismantle the family. Now, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, and this is not a story from an unreputable source. This man was in the meeting, and the president said, no, thank you. We're fine without your money. Thank God. Okay? But I say that to say these are the times we are living in. This isn't just about America. This isn't just about our political pot. This is the world. God is up to something. And what Paul is saying here today to us is, you got to wake up. I have far too many peers, peer pastors, who have not woken up yet. They think we're going to go back to reset in a few months. It's not going to happen. I can guarantee you that. So you and I need to be people who are awake in the day in which we live, understand the times as the men of Issachar, but also understand the calling that Paul is giving us here to be awake. And, and that is different from understanding our times. The present time that Paul is talking about in this text is the time in your life when you got reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. Uh, you were filled with the Spirit when you put your faith in Christ, and now Christ is increasing in you, conforming you to his own image. It's this present time, says Paul, between being lost in the sleep of sin, where you were, had no relationship with God because of your sin and your lack of knowledge of Jesus Christ, and being awake completely in the light of Christ that you will enjoy in all of eternity. We are in the in-between zone, according to Paul. We are coming awake to what will be complete light at some point in heaven. And Paul says, the hour has already come for you to wake up. So it, this is something that happened in the past. He's saying, you got saved in the past. You woke up in the past. That hour has already come to wake up from your slumber. What slumber? The slumber of separation from God. The slumber of ignorance about God. The slumber of the penalty of your sin. That spiritual slumber. That day's past for the people of God who know Christ. Now sleep is a, is a great description for those who do not know Christ of life apart from Christ. When you're not spiritually awake yet, you're powerless to really be alive. Scientists tell us that when we sleep, um, most of our, our, our uh, muscle functions are virtually paralyzed, except for your breathing and except for your, your eye motion. But in most people, unless something is wired differently or gone haywire, you don't actually live out your dreams while you're dreaming, right? Okay, you're you're prone there in bed, but you're not you're not. So no, so if you imagine murdering somebody, I, I've actually I've actually dreamt this that I've murdered people. I honest confessions here, uh, ugly honest confessions. I, I've dreamt I've murdered people, and I'm so grateful to wake up. You know, it's like, wow, that feels so good to wake up. Uh, but this is the description Paul uses of people without Christ. He says, when you're, before you're awakened spiritually, you are powerless. You're, you're just kind of comatose spiritually. You, you're not really living. Oh yeah, you're having dreams. You're kind of, you're having experiences, but you're not living like God wants you to live. You're not experiencing real life. You're, you're kind of uh, just experiencing a dream. And he says in verses 11 and 12, he says, because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night's nearly over. What night? Your night of living in sin. Your night of being a sinner is almost over. The day, what day? The day of Christ. The day when you experience Him unfettered face to face in heaven. That day is almost here. That day came for Timothy McKenna this week. He shed this mortal coil, as Shakespeare says, and what? That new day dawned. But he was just like us until that point, 
living in this in-between time uh, between the dawning and the full day. Um, now, this text says here, because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. And some of you may read that and say, wait a minute, I got saved, you know, when I was 25 years old. What do you mean my salvation's nearer? Because the Bible uses salvation in a, it, it, not as a point in time experience always, although it does sometimes speak about that. But in, and this, in fact, is one of those times it's saying a point in time salvation will yet come to you as followers of Christ. And that will be complete salvation from your sinful nature, from your broken body, uh, and that will be the termination of your salvation. But honestly, I need more saving today as a 64-year-old man than I needed at 8 years old. So salvation is one of those continuing sort of experiences that, that we are called to enter into every single day. Somebody you know, might ask you, when did you get saved? And I say, about three seconds ago. I just got saved again. Because uh, I'm constantly needing the salvation of Christ to work into my soul. What about night? He says the night is nearly over here. That, of course, is the darkness that we all must still live in and face being residents of in this sin-soaked world. As many as you know, uh, we sold our house a few weeks ago and we've moved out to the family home on Coeur d'Alene now. And one of the wonderful things about being on a lake in the morning that faces east is what? You get to watch the sunrises. That was this morning. Okay, so I got up, uh, thankfully it's not at 4.30 right now. It's more like 6.15. And I got up this, uh, this morning and that sight greeted me. And, if, you know, the difference between sunsets and sunrises is sunrises dissipate much more quickly. I mean, you can go to get your camera and it's gone. Uh, sunsets usually last a little while. But uh, this is the picture that Paul is painting of life right now before the full light of day. I mean, a, a good 45 minutes after this, I got in the car and I still had to turn the lights on to, to drive into town safely not, so that other cars at least could see me. So things are still kind of ill-defined. Uh, you can't really see everything. That's the nature of sunrises. And that's the nature of your life and mind, according to Paul. He said, we're in, the, we're in the sunrise zone right now. And the full light of day, which is going to be eternity, I mean, this little blip of time here, you're going to look back and you're going to say, you know, there was some beauty there. There's some, there, there was something special about being in between, being in the dark, and now living in the complete light that I'm in. And this is what we must never forget as a people of God. We're not just enduring what we have to right now to get to the full day. God is giving us some sunrises in every person's life that you're going to look back on and you're going to say, you know, there was something beautiful about choosing Christ that day instead of my flesh. There was something beautiful uh, about freely loving Him that day instead of well, I don't know, not having a choice like I got now in heaven. I'm perfect. I, there was something beautiful about that. This is the picture Paul's painting for, for life right now. Before the full light of glory of, of life in heaven, unfiltered presence of Christ, there's a beauty we're, we're, we get to engage in. We don't always do it, but we get to engage in it. If you're awake, you get to see the sunrise. If you're not, you miss it. C.S. Lewis caught one aspect of this in his book, The Great Divorce, which is a hypothetical situation of where some people who are living in hell uh, actually uh, have a, a ticket, get a ticket to heaven on a bus to heaven. And they go to heaven, and they hate it. Why? Because there are colors they've never seen before. There's sound they've never heard before. There, there's a brightness that just is blinding, and they can't stand it. And they ask to go back to hell because they prefer their isolation, they prefer their darkness because they're not ready for heaven. We're in that in-between zone where God is preparing you and me for the brilliance of heaven. And He's inviting you to experience Christ right now in a way that prepares you for that 
but also creates a sunrise in your life that is memorable. So Paul now is going to call us into, into living in, into this light as opposed to continuing to live in the darkness of sin. Uh, what is the difference between how you live at night and how you live in the light? What's the difference with, between how you uh, hike at night and how you hike in the daytime? How you, anything you do. I mean, what happens in the night, we have to slow everything down, don't we? You cannot run full tilt out or you'll run into a tree somewhere, right? Uh, you, you cannot see as far ahead. You, you, there are sounds that scare you at night that don't scare you in the daytime. I mean, just living at night is a different kind of experience than living in the light. This world, apart from Christ, is simply sort of sleepwalking through life. I, I, I used to be a sleepwalker, so I've got a little experience with this. When I was a kid, um, some mornings I'd get up and my parents would say, ah, did you sleep well last night? And I'd say, yeah, it was great. They'd say, good, do you know what you did last night? No. Oh, well, we had a meeting here of the church last night, and um, you came out in your pajamas and just sat down next to some of the people. I said, really? I don't remember anything about that. They said, yeah. I said, did I make a fool of myself? They said, no. No, we just kind of ushered you back to bed. That's, that's what the world is experiencing. They're oblivious to the reality, the real reality in Christ. Life as it's meant to be. But they're just kind of walking around, not really registering what is going on in life. And millions of people are living glitzy, sleepwalking lives today apart from Christ. But they might as well be dead because what they're experiencing is not the life of wide awake to God. John Piper puts it this way. He says, be careful. Everything in this world that does not awaken more faith in Christ will put you to sleep. Most of the world thinks it's wide awake when it is sound asleep. Entertainment-saturated people who do not treasure Christ above all, are like skydivers who think that the wind passing through their fingers at 120 miles an hour is the ultimate thrill of being alive when in fact they have no parachutes. And the gravity that pulls them inexorably to the ground is their sin and the wrath of God. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life but the wrath of God remains on him. And John concludes, he says, this is not a time to be sleepwalking or sleep skydiving. This is a time to wake up and get dressed and love your neighbor as yourself. So, since that is not anybody's present state apart from Christ, Paul is now calling those who are in Christ to live in the light of that reality that you get to put on Christ on every decision that you make in life. Verse 12, so let us put aside the deeds of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. There's a contrast happening here. Take off this, put this on. That's common biblical language. This is one of different clothing. What he's saying is, you know, you used to parade around in your pajamas of darkness. I'm calling you to put armor up in the light. I don't know if I'm the only crazy guy in the room, but uh, any of you ever had dreams where you, you showed up at work and you were in your pajamas? Yeah, I mean, or yeah, yeah worse. Uh, okay? Uh, I'm so grateful to wake up from those dreams. It's like, whoo, boy, that would have been embarrassing at the church um, if I showed up in my pajamas. And, uh, and yet, that's what so much of the church is doing today in the battle. God has said, you, my children, you are in a battle. You need to not only get out of your pajamas of darkness, but you need to get into armor of light. You need to armor up full battle gear because you're not asleep anymore. You, you, you pretend like you're asleep, you're going to get killed in this battle. You're going to get wasted in this battle. John Piper says again, he says, Paul chooses a word here that implies that the Christian life is not just a wakeful life, 
but a wakeful battle. While we were sleepwalking in unbelief, oblivious to the reality of Christ, we walked in darkness, and the clothing we wore were the works of darkness. Now God awakens us from this stupor of unbelief. We embrace Christ as Savior and Lord, and we treasure Him above all else, and we put on armor, weaponry, because the Christian life is a battle. To be awake is to be at war. So when you got woken up by Christ and you put your faith in Him, the bad news is you joined a war. You joined an army. You didn't have any choice about it. And now Christ is saying, put on the armor. Fellow Christ followers, are we ready to bury the sleepy notion that the rest of life in this world is not meant to be like silverwood? It is meant to be like Afghanistan. Are you ready for that? Are you ready? Parents, if you're not raising your children today with a warfare mentality, you are going to lose them to the faith. If they don't know that they're going to either be arrows in the hands of the Lord of hosts, or they're going to be sticks of kindling in the enemy's hands, you haven't done them justice to prepare them for this world. You have got to prepare them for this world and for the battle that they are going to face. It's going to be a more difficult battle than you faced. And they've got to be prepared for it. We must teach the next generation of Christ followers how to dress, how to live, and how to fight like Paul's calling us to here. And here Paul exhorts us to put on the armor of light. What is that armor? Well, he tells us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, he gives us a little clue here. He says, those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on, and here's the armor, the breastplate of faith and love, and the helmet of the hope of salvation. Faith, hope, and love. Those are the three parts of the armor that cover two parts of our spiritual condition. So he's saying your head needs some protection. Your thoughts need protection. And your, your breastplate, the, the, the part that covers your, your vital organs, your heart and emotions, they need protection as well. So Paul says, we must wake up to the battle we're in. We must put on the armor of light. We must put on faith and hope and love. Only those can keep us awake. Only those can break the power of the sleeping pills of television and advertising and sex and addictions and materialism, and you keep the list going. That may seem a little vague. Just say, well, put on faith, hope, and love. What is that? Well, he tells us in verse 14. He says in verse 14, put on Christ. Put on Christ. Well, what does that mean to put on Christ? That means that every temptation I come up against, every time I have to make a decision, I have a choice. Am I going to keep my pajamas of darkness on, or am I going to put on Christ? And I, so I get to say, Lord, please, I need you right now. I, need, I, I cannot beat this temptation. You know, we've got a garbage can full of the stuff that we're all wrestling with, right? We did that this morning. I can't do that unless I put on Christ. Would you please put Christ on me right now? Would you please clothe me with His eyes to see? Would you please clothe me with His heart to feel? Would you please clothe me and just go down the list of whatever it is that you need to be in that moment? Um, so put on the Lord Jesus Christ uh, and he says, if you do that, you won't have to, you won't fall for the darkness. As John Piper said, it's like skydiving. Would any of us go skydiving without a parachute unless you wanted to commit suicide? Of course not. And once you jumped out of that airplane and were falling through the sky, would you try to punch holes in that parachute? Of course not. Because you know your life depends on it. And so does our life in Christ. Our life in Christ depends upon us deploying His covering over us all the time and not sabotaging it with sin and not punching holes in it 
And he says, no, put on the parachute of Christ. And this journey to the end will be memorable. It will be beautiful. Oh, it'll, it'll go like that. And from eternity's perspective, you'll look at it and say, wow, that was a quick, quick sunrise. But it will be Christ. So in verse 13, let us behave decently. And, and now he's going he's gonna to give several examples here, just uh, quick examples. As the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, so stop doing that. But you can't just stop. You've got to fill it with something. Rather, clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think. And he uses a term that deals with our mind here, that deals with thought process. Do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. When he says, do not think about that, he's giving us a clue about how we're supposed to put Christ on. Thinking certain thoughts, we all know, can awaken certain desires, either for good or evil, right? We think thoughts of retribution and bitterness and anger. What are you going to, what is that going to end in? That's going to end in broken relationship. It might even end in murder, okay? You think thoughts of forgiveness and of compassion and of humility What's that going to end in? Restored relationship, loving people because they're sinners just like you. Yeah, bringing them to Jesus. It's going to be a whole host of really wonderful types of things. Verse 13 says, let us walk properly as in the daytime. And then it gives kind of three categories. Not in uh, orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy. Um, so... These are just three exemplary categories of sins that can afflict any of us. The first one's sort of the uh, inordinate desire for some sort of substance or something that, that kind of feeds an addiction, whether it's uh, alcohol or drugs or uh, stimulation or fun or whatever it is. It, it feeds an addiction. Uh, the second one is inordinate desires for sex, whether it's fornication, adultery, or incest, or pornography, or whatever. The third one is desires for preeminence, control, attention, that produces quarreling and jealousy. Now, for instance, if you're bored, or lonely, or tired, or discouraged, you're feeling hopeless, you can sit around and ponder what it feels like to have the next hit, can't you? What it feels like to get Wasted, can't you? Or you can stir up the new faith in you and you can imagine what it's going to be like not to be driven by wrong messages or feeling feelings that you find repulsive, but what it's going to feel like to walk with Christ through that boredom, through that fatigue, through that discouragement. Don't let the thoughts of your mind lead you back into darkness. Frustrated housewife, working moms, maybe you're married to a man who has never learned affection, never learned tenderness, never learned how to simply talk about what matters to you or listen. Don't daydream about Mr. Perfect. Don't let those thoughts take hold in your head. Rather, put on Christ. What, what is Christ thinking about my spouse right now? How is Christ wanting me to be to them right now as imperfect as they are? And the same goes for husbands. Don't think about that person at the office. That's not who God wants you to Put your affection on. Or what about quarreling and jealousy? If, you, if you've been wrong, maybe it was years ago, you maybe got overlooked, you got belittled or misunderstood or abandoned. Don't let those thoughts dominate your thinking. Don't make provision for them. They're going to awaken resentment. Instead, cry out to Christ and say, Lord, how, how do you want me to think about this 
truly grievous offense that I experienced. How, how do you want me to react to this? How do you want me to move forward from this? How do you want me to vanquish this? The answer to all of that is that you and I need to learn to put on Christ. Every moment, every decision, calling to mind who He is, crying out to the Spirit to tell us and remind us again. Putting on the Lord Jesus Christ is not just an alternative to making provision for the flesh. It's the only way to not make provision for the flesh. It's the only way to kill sinful thoughts. It's the only way to keep them from arising. It's the only way to create the life that Christ wants for you. So let's close this today by uh, remembering that this, this whole paragraph is just a continuation to live into the love of Christ as it relates to other people. It's about how love looks in this day of fading darkness and the dawning light that you and I are headed to. And very specifically, we learn from verse 13 that what God has joined together for our good, love doesn't tear apart. God has joined our bodies and our minds together. And Paul says, don't tear it apart with alcohol. Don't tear it apart with some substance that's going to separate the mind that God gave you from your body. And then he moves on to, to marriage and he says, uh, God has joined you to a covenant of marriage, whether you're married or not, I would say. And here's why. When we cultivate sex outside of marriage or sexual stimulation outside of marriage, with a somebody who we have no marriage covenant with, we tear apart what God has joined together for our good. That is not what love does. Love does not tear people apart. And I can just tell you, being a pastor and talking with hundreds of people who have torn that bond, so many would do anything to never have torn it. So, but, but if you tear it, know that God is still able to stitch things. There will be a scar, but He's the only one who can re-stitch it. Only one. You won't find that solution anywhere else. And finally, if you know, God has joined people together in a family, in His family, in small families, but in His church, in communities that are to be known for forgiveness. Don't let the enemy tear it apart. Don't let God get in either your family, or the enemy get into either your family or the church or anything through bitterness or anger or whatever it is. God says, instead, put on Christ. Do experience the life of Christ in your families, in your churches, that can only come when you clothe yourself in Him. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you that there are so many reminders just in every day how gracious and good you are and how reflective it is of, of our experience with you. I, I, I thank you for sleep that rejuvenates us. And it's just a reminder that you're giving to us when we're doing nothing. When we can do nothing, you're pouring out your grace on us. And I want to thank you too for sunrises that remind us that we're in the in-between zone here. We're moving to a bright and glorious day. And as kind of obscure and sometimes dark as this sunrise appears, Lord, thank you that there's beauty in it. And that beauty is to put on Christ. So I pray for my brothers and sisters here. I pray for myself. I pray that you this week would show us in, in just real clear situations and those things we've dumped in the trash can here that we want to be free with, uh, would you please show us how to put on Christ? Would you please show us to how to enter into this battle fully armored up so that we're not losing heart, we're not getting wounded in ways that we didn't have to. Lord, thank you so much for the privilege of being a part of a group of people who are taking courageous stands for light, for righteousness. I've been so blessed by 
hearing so many testimonies in these last few weeks about people making the hardest decisions of their life, deciding about their careers, about their jobs, and putting on Christ. So we pray for one another. Lord, continue to strengthen us. We don't have the strength, but continue to show us how to put you on in this time of dawning light in our world. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, God bless you this week. Go and uh, learn what it is to put Christ on. And if we can pray for you this morning, if there's anything on your heart and you just say, yeah, I'd like to be prayed for, please come on up and, and we'll be delighted to pray for you. God bless.